right, how's everybody doing tonight? It's been a long time. You know, I told God that I would actually do a message tonight. And so he's holding me to just that. I'm supposed to be doing this every week and it's been, I don't know, what has it been? Over a month, six weeks. Last time I, well, not the last time, but one of the last times I saw Earl, he said, so when are you going to teach on church history? Brother Scotty, I want to thank you um, for offering to take care of my my car if it hopefully it won't come to that I'm gonna have Earl replace the the cam sensor and see if that that clears up the issue so I finally got my car back it only took seven months but it, like like I had told you guys before the harness had been eaten by rats and had been sitting for since 20 I guess 2016 so I'll never buy a car that sat that long again Unless I'm getting a 72 Cuda 340, which is really my dream car. But this is the closest I can get now. So um, I'm, I'm actually very happy and pleased with with having that car. Because you all know I lost my other Challenger, the one I called the Silver Beast. Well, this one I shouldn't lose because there's no payment on it. I bought it for cash when I bought it. It just I ended up paying a lot more than I ever anticipated. But I had money at the time when I bought it. So... Now I'm broke. But anyway, that's beside the point. Well, the Dodgers won today. So Brother Charles McLean, Brother Thomas, I was happy about that. But, you know, I was thinking about it. And I was I was thinking about, you know, delivering the Word of God because I knew God wanted me to. <clears throat> and about how much time has passed. And I thought about all the years I was faithful to the things of God and how, you know, now I could say like Martin Luther, like I haven't open my Bible and wow, like I haven't got my face into the book in years, actually. I think Martin Luther said he hadn't read the Bible for like a year, but he's considered one of the heroes of faith, one of the men that started the, the Protestant Reformation, but he still wanted to remain Catholic. That's why the, the Lutheran Church, which is based off of Martin Luther, a lot of the rituals and rites are very similar to Catholicism because of that because of that, the fact that he wanted to remain Catholic, and it was patterned after him. But I remember um, not too long ago, I'd, when I had seen Earl, he said, so when are you going to get in on church history? When are you going to talk about that? And, you know, we're going to talk about church history. I mean, um, to know where we're going, to, to see where we're going, we must first see where we have been as a church as a whole. And you know what? I was listening to Christian radio today, and and it was it was it was pretty decent. And then it just went off into the the rules and regulations. And look, to dumpster dive into the sea of humanity. Maybe I'd have a church if I did that. You know, maybe I'd have a church if I told men to behave, and that's what all the ladies wanted to hear. That tell the men to behave because men act like jerks. Well, look, it goes both ways, guys. But um. The failure of humanity, behavioral modification, has nothing to do with your relationship to God, with your relationship to Jesus. Now, now, you might hear this and say, oh, Brother Rick says I can drink a beer and I can drink. And look, if you want to become a drunk and that becomes your God, well, one day you're going to stand before Jesus and you'll give account of that. If chasing the ladies becomes more of a thing to me than God or Jesus, I'll have to give account for that. But Jesus came and he literally condemned sin in the flesh. The Bible tells us that it was like he moved us out of the way of something that was falling. Look, it tells you in Proverbs, the seven deadly sins, the seven things that God hates, so to speak, and six are an abomination. That's in Proverbs. And ain't none of those things in there is what the church is preaching against. Look, God is bigger than the stupid things that we do. Jesus is bigger than the failure of humanity that we possess. And you know, I rebel also against the thing about the blessing. I mean, maybe it's hard for me to receive from God. Because maybe I've swung so far one way that I naturally, subconsciously even rebel against it. That that could be true. But um, my whole thing is I've read Hebrews 11 and, and they didn't get a blessing. They got a cup of persecution. 
and they martyred. They were martyred. They died for the faith. They died for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they were looking on a world, on a place, on a kingdom. You know, they were looking to heaven, the heavenly kingdom, God's kingdom. But they were they were looking to that world, to that kingdom, instead of this one. And they were willing to die for the gospel. Now, thank God, in this country, at this time, we don't have to die for the gospel. The Bible clearly tells us that it, it is by the Holy Ghost, he that restraineth, that, that constrains the spirit of Antichrist from manifesting. Literally, Christian believers, true believers filled with the Holy Spirit, keep the evilness at bay, keep the Antichrist from taking place on the stage of humanity. And that's why you got this idiotic stuff that goes on where they talk about, do you believe in post-tribulation? Do you believe in pre-tribulation? Do you believe this and that? Look, it's very clear. He that constraineth that the, that the evil one, the Antichrist, cannot manifest as long as he's here. Well, when the church is raptured, raptured is not even the Bible, but when it's caught up, when they're caught up, literally, people say, oh, I don't want to die. I hope I go in the rapture. Well, what do you think the rapture is? You're going to die. It's just all of us are going to die in once in unison and get caught up. In the moment of a twinkling of an eye, we're not going to feel anything. One day we'll be here, the next minute, instance, we'll be with the Lord. It's like I've spoke many times at funerals when you're, when you're talking about a believer, that someone believes in Jesus Christ, someone that loves God, someone that puts their trust, their faith, the very act of faithing in God, in Jesus, in the finished work of the cross. When they take the last breath, when they take that last breath, they're with the Lord. I've said it at funerals before. I said it's like that. I think I said it at my aunt's funeral, and I might have said it at um, Veronica's mother's funeral. But I, it reminds me of that Twilight Zone episode where Robert Wet, Robert Redford's playing Death. He's when he's a young actor. He's a young man. He wasn't even famous yet, I don't believe. And this old lady says, I know who you are. I'm not going to let you in. And she knew he was Death. And somehow he tricked her and he got into the house and she said, I knew it. I knew you were death. And he said, there's nothing to be afraid of. And he, and he, and he, um, he takes her hand. She's all, is it going to hurt? And he, he points to her body. He said, it's already done. She looks over and her body's on the bed. She's gone and she's, she's walks off with death. Well, the Bible tells us death, where is thou sting? Meaning, where is your sting? For those that don't understand the these and thous. Where is your sting? Where is your victory? Because Christ takes away that sting. So I truly believe when we cross over it's instantaneous. Instantaneous. And that's what it will be like during the rapture during the catching away of the church. But I was watching the... I wasn't watching the game. I don't watch the games. I listen to the games on AM570. The baseball games, the Dodger games. I listened to Rick Monday. Charlie Steiner's been sick. And um, Tim Neverett's. I like Tim Neverett's. And I, I know Brother McLean said he likes Tim Neverett's. But um, I listened to them. But Tim Neverett's isn't doing the postseason for the Dodgers. He used to do the postseason with the Red Sox. And he was with the Red Sox for a long time. But he's a good announcer. And one day I'll play one of his calls when, uh, I, I guess, when Teoscar Hernandez hit that that big home run during the regular season. They came back in the ninth inning from like five runs down and five runs down in the ninth and they came back and won. But anyway, I was listening to the game. I was getting stressed out because it's my team. You know, I was getting anxiety. You know, I didn't want them to get bounced by the Padres, by the Friars again, like in 2022. And I began to remember something I studied a long time ago that we had studied as a church that, Pastor Daniel had, had been studying and teaching us. And we're studying, um, we're literally studying about the great whore of Babylon. And that's how, why I've told you guys before, the great whore of Babylon is not the Catholic Church. It's not any institution. It's definitely not the United States of America. 
because the United States of America consists of God's people, so that's not the Great Whore of Babylon. That is just that is just straight stupid, okay? That's stupid. That's what an unlearned, unknowledgeable person would come up with. Stupidity. Stupid. So, the United States is a tribe of Manasseh, descendant of Israel, descendant of Joseph. And you say, oh, Rick, that's that's you're you're talking about like that. British Israelitism. Look. I'm not talking about a cult here, but the sad thing is, in some cults, there's some truth. You just got to pull it out. You got to know what you're looking for. You got to know the word of God and know what is, you got to rightly divide the word. Okay. You got to rightly divide the word of God. If you can, you know, most people don't even know how to read, let alone read the Bible, which, which is fine. I mean, whether you're smart whether you're stupid, you can get saved. You know, with God, there's... In fact, I think it's probably easier for you to get saved if you are stupid. Because you could just believe the Word of God. It reminds me of this story. Um, these missionaries, they went out to Africa, right? And there there was like a war going on or something, right? And, and this was like... I, I don't remember when this was. If it was the 70s or the 80s. I mean, when was an Africa in war, right? So anyway... It's like that movie, uh, Tears of the Sun, and Bruce Willis said, God left Africa years ago. But anyway, that's beside the point. But there was some war going on in Africa. These missionaries had to leave, and the only thing they left this, this tribe of people with, this people with there, was the Book of John in their language. And the country opened back up, and they were able to go back to this um, place in Africa where they were ministering to, like, something like 10... It might have been ten or like ten years later or something, right? And the small town that they administered in was huge, huge, all kinds of people, and they were all Christians. And these people had miracles happening in their midst because they read the Book of John and they saw where Jesus healed people and they saw that Christ was in them. See, they, they simply read. They simply read the Word of God. They didn't have anybody to teach them. They didn't have any idiotic denomination to, to give them the rules and regulations of stupid nonsense and trash. Is all that is, is trash. So they had no missed preconception in their brain, to say it that way. They, they didn't have no idea of what Christianity was or what it should be. They simply saw that Jesus healed people. And that his followers healed people. So these missionaries come back in, and, and, and the power of God is flowing through this place, man. Flowing through it. And um, these people didn't go to the hospital because they simply prayed for people to get sick and get healed. And God was showing up in their midst because they were too stupid to know that the miracles died with the apostles. The miracles never died with the apostles. People just don't believe the word of God. Look, there was a time period, there was a stretch when I was... God had me praying for people, and they're getting healed like constantly, like popcorn. I haven't seen that for a long time. Maybe it's because I'm not in the Word as much, not doing the things I'm supposed to be doing for, for Jesus, for God. But we're slowly making our way back into that. So the thing that I started to do as a 30-year-old man, as a young man, young cocky preacher, thought I was a hot shot, I will do as a 50-year-old man. Now, with more maturity, with more life experience, and getting closer to my time of meeting Jesus, so there'll be a little more urgency. But, to get back to what I was saying, I was listening to the Dodger game, and I was getting vexed. I was getting stressed out. I was getting near, you know, I was being a fan. And I remembered the stuff we studied. The Articles of Zion, I believe it was called, The Articles of Zion. It was designed to literally just wreck the nation, just to obliviate Christianity, basically. To make Big Brother be your mama or your papa. Let's say it that way. Globalism. One world government. One world government. Literally preparation for Antichrist. Rolling out the red carpet. I don't know if they know they're doing it, but their ideology sucks. 
and it's leading to hell. To hell on earth is what it's going to do. Okay? But the idea was you get people so caught up in sporting events. Sporting events. So this was like in the early... This must have been, this must have came out like probably 1911. I wanted to say the 1920s, 30s, but there was already, there was sporting events already. So maybe the idea was already in motion, but this probably came out in the 30s. You'd have to ask Pastor Daniel about that because he's the one who taught about this. And you get people so caught up in sporting events that everything in the world just passes them by. Voltaire, the French philosopher, one good thing he said, if you read the books, you rule the world. That's about the only good thing he said that I could think of. But the other thing he said was he called the church lyamphemy. We must destroy lyamphemy. We must destroy the church. So France ended up having what was like a universal church, like a state-run church. That's not a church. The church is the ecclesia, the called out ones. Those that respond to the message preached. Those that respond to the crier. That's the church. True unity in Christianity is every member of the body of Christ doing his part, functioning accordingly. Not stacking a bunch of people in a mega church and telling them how great they are when they're not. And the reason I say that, we're born in this diseased humanity. After the fall of Adam, this diseased Adamic race, I call it, right? Diseased Adamic race. But in spite of that, God sees us as valuable. He sees us as worth saving. He sees us as his family. And he comes to redeem us. Now, you can't say that God never gets angry. The Bible tells you that God makes alive, God makes dead. He says he kills, he makes alive. Does that mean he wants to? No, but he's all powerful. He can do whatever he wants. But what makes him great is he chooses to be a good and loving God to those who fear him. To those that will call on him. He chooses to do that. He does it because he wants to. It's like when Jesus walked the earth and that leopard came. He said, Lord, if you heal me, if you want to, you could heal me. And Jesus said, I want to. And he touched him and he healed him. It's amazing when you think about it. Because we're not worthy of his love. The Bible tells us that in Genesis 6, 5, you look down at the sea of humanity at this entire planet and said their hearts are evil continually. Nothing good in them. Nothing at all. You know, as human beings, we struggle with unforgiveness, struggle with anger, bitterness, resentment, lust, everything that corrupts us from the inside out. But the church is busy grinning for the world and trying to make themselves look pretty and great. Well, you can make a pig look pretty darn great if you put it in a suit now, can't you? It's still a pig. We have to forgive because Jesus forgave. Some people you forgive by faith. You know, people in the church even, they, get, they hold on to stuff for years and they get angry and bitter. All that does is just that just kills you from the inside. And Jesus doesn't want that. God doesn't want that. We have to forgive because if anybody has the right to consume us and destroy us, it's God. For the fact that we're breathing. Because we're evil continually. Whether we know we are or not. Evil continually. That doesn't change. Human nature does not change one iota. Not one little bit. Evil continually. But thank God he sent his son. Thank God he sent Jesus Christ to redeem us, to give us life. 
church history, we got to go to the beginning, see where things begin to move, the stream through God's spirit, stream through legalism, and another stream through just straight nonsense, stupidity, and trash, which unfortunately seems to be kind of the norm of today. You know, thousands of people flock to the mega churches. What if God asked them to do something for him? How many of them do you think would run immediately as if rats running from a sinking ship, off a sinking ship? God knows the heart. Jesus knows our heart. You can't fool him. I ran and ran and I've struggled and I didn't want to preach and I really don't want to preach because I know who I am on the inside. And God does too. But he won't leave me alone. So what choice do I have? So yes, there's free will, but <laughs> is there really an alternative? You know, I have a right to be angry if I want to be angry. I waited for a car for seven months. I've been working on a movie for five years. Stuff that would take some heathen that never would give God a nickel or even open the book for five seconds. It would take them like a year to finish that movie and their car would be done in two weeks. But I don't expect anything to ever be easy. I mean, wasn't easy for Jesus to get crucified and rise from the dead, right? You know, I made more money when I was a darn heathen. When I said, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus, but didn't serve him. The trials came after I served him. The trials came after I began to stand for God. Stand for Jesus. Sometimes it's not about what, it's not about, it's not, not sometimes, it's never about what you're going to get for God. Sometimes it's about what are you willing to give up for God? What are you willing to sacrifice and risk for God? You know, some of the martyrs in Hebrew 11, they gave up their life. They gave up their lives. But they're with Jesus. They're with their reward. They're with the God that loves them. Christianity is not how we look, how we smile and grin, or what nice things we do. Christianity is about living a life before God in spite of who and what we are. And that's the message. Oh, my cat Bailey is getting big and ornery. Buddy got broken while he got fixed, so um, now he's the cool cat that he was when he was little before. That's my cats. But you, Pastor Daniel, you would like Buddy, and Pastor David, I know you would like Buddy. He's like a big Tom cat, like a big alley cat. He's cool. And Bailey's a Siamese. I never wanted a Siamese cat, but you know what? I didn't want the raccoon that's been hanging out here to kill her, and so I took her in and adopted her and been getting her shots and all that, so I, yeah, I have a couple cats, so that's interesting. I always thought I'd have a dog as much as I like wolves, and got to keep the coyotes away now. And the raccoon pretty much lives next door to me, so um, me and him are cool now. He doesn't bother me, I don't bother him. He used to make a lot of noise, he used to irritate me. These are weird looking sounded things. First time I heard it, I thought it was a demon screeching. I was like, what the heck is that? I went outside and there's this big giant raccoon. But anyway, that's me living out here in the sticks in my trailer. Trailer's cool. Oh, I'm in this, in my, this is my bedroom actually, as you could probably tell. But I'm in here because the rest of my, my trailer, I'm re, I'm, I had to get all my stuff out of storage and I'm getting everything in order. So it's just a disaster zone in there. So um, hopefully I'll get that cleaned up enough before baseball season's over because I got a big screen in there and. Maybe we'll hook it up and get it get to see a couple games instead of me listening to it on AM five seventy like I like to do so much. But um, all right, guys, that's the message for tonight. Earl, I'm coming to see you Thursday unless you cancel on me, and um, we'll see if we can get that issue figured out with the car, which I'm sure you can. And then um, and brother Scotty, thanks for always helping me out and for offering to help with this nightmare vehicle if it 
doesn't all come together. It is a beast, but um, I haven't drove it more than a hundred miles, and I I think we got it got it picked up like uh, finally after seven months, like I don't know two weeks ago. But I'm haven't been driving it much. But anyway, that's the message, and I will be doing these more, and we'll get on church history, and. And then maybe after that, we'll talk more about Babylon and the tribes and see where, where God leads us. But church history is next on the agenda. That's the message, guys. Have a good night. Thanks for tuning in.